going to have Jen come up and uh, kick off the program. Thank you all very much. So, uh, let's see, how do we start the show? Is this thing? Is that going to help? See. Anyone told me how to start this. Um, okay. It's down. Down. You have, you have a click it. Let's okay. do. Let's see. New slideshow. Slideshow. Sorry. New program. All right. Great. So. All right. So I've been charged tonight um, with really giving you guys an overview of where we are in Massachusetts and in you know in context of our whole nation in terms of the obesity uh, epidemic. And I gotta say. We're in Massachusetts, we don't think we have a problem, we have a big problem. So, starting with some figures, um, basing it off of body mass index. I think most of you guys know what body mass index is, but I just wanna remind you, if you're an adult, don't sit here and calculate it out. I did this today and I sort of freaked out because I put in 60 inches instead of 70 inches, but it's okay. Um, but this is where we are with for adults, and basically you can see from this is that it's ba nice and really linearly correlated with amount of percent body fat. So BMI of over 25 is considered overweight, and over 30 is considered obese for an adult. And for children, it's a little bit different. You go off of CDC growth charts, um, which are age and gender specific. So for instance, my three-year-old daughter here, um, two-year-old daughter, three-year-old daughter, she's got a BMI of 16. She falls in the 50th percentile, which is fine. 85th percentile to 95th percentile is considered overweight, greater than the 95th is considered obese. So this is what we need to do for children under the age of 19 years of age. So pre prevalence and trends. Um, really, what just came out this year in a uh, really recent Robert Wood Johnson report was that Massachusetts has the second lowest percent of obese adults and the 26th highest percent of obese and overweight children in the US. Okay, what does this mean? The second lowest of adult obesity. That means out of the 50, 51 states, we're not as obese as the rest of the nation. In terms of our children, the problem's a little different. We're right smack in the middle. Uh, if you look at adult obesity, um, compared to the US, US in blue, the trajectory since 1995, and this isn't even the last two decades, this is really the last decade and a half, the increase in the relative rates of obesity, this is not overweight included, just obese, and here's where Massachusetts is trending. Looks like it might be leveling off a little bit, um, yet to be seen. And then with kids, you see that um, really you have sort of a very linear trend, might have leveled off a little bit, yet to be seen. But the problem is, okay, it's leveled off, maybe things are getting better, no, it has not reversed yet. So it's gonna take a you know, good deal of time for this to really change. Uh, looking at the nation, I think most of you guys have seen one of these CDC maps on looking at the relative rates of obesity, and this is in kids aged 10 to 17 years of age. Um, 13 to 14 percent relative overweight, uh, relative obesity rates, puts us at 26 for kids, and that's Massachusetts right there in the gray. Not doing quite as well as some of those blue states. Um, and then you can see the red here with rates as high as 22, 23 percent of overweight, of overweight, of obese kids, and especially Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas. My brother lives in Texas. He's like, you guys up there. So I'm like, hey. You know, so they think the warm states. I'm like, it's really the cold. States. He's like, you guys are always cold. You eat a lot. You don't exercise. They're like, oh no, no, no. So let's get that straight. Um, so going on, looking at, um, sorry, did I miss one here? No. In looking at overweight and obesity by grade, um, looking at boys and girls, we typically, I think, associate the overweight and obese problem to females, but really in young kids and adolescents. Boys tend to be more overweight than girls. And you can see here, um, overweight and obesity, you know, in the US and in, in Massachusetts in 2007, 33 to 38% in boys and girls, just a little bit less, you know, right around 32, 33%. Uh, looking at by family income, very important in our state relative to the US. Um, US is in blue, and again, Massachusetts in red. Um, less than 100% of the federal poverty level, so these are you know, less the poor. Um, looking at Massachusetts, 45% of those individuals who fall below that federal poverty level are overweight or obese. Compared to the US um, standard, which is 40%, meaning Massachusetts is actually faring worse than the rest of the United States in terms of our poor, in terms of how obese they are in our state. 
Um, and you can see here um, the um, wealthier, much lower at about half the rate of 22, um, 22 to 24%. And looking at uh, racial and ethnic disparities, just one example, looking at our Hispanic children in our state relative to the United States population. 27% uh, in the US, uh, sorry, see, Hispanic in Massachusetts versus non-Hispanic, about, almost about double. And then if you look at the US, 38% uh, in, um, you know, the relative, the 38% in, that are Hispanic in the US being overweight obese versus our 45% here. So again, the racial and ethnic disparities, just like the income disparities, are worse in Massachusetts compared to the rest of the United States. Uh, causes of obesity. So we've got the stats. We know there's a problem. What is causing it? I think there's a lot of things out in the media now about what is actually causing it. And you can see here, there's really a model that's been used a lot now in research and in policy called the socio-ecological model of obesity. And really what this states is, is a very tangled web of many things that go in to cause obesity in children and in adults. And this goes from the societal level, so the society that we live in, we live in the U.S. versus the U.K. versus South Africa, uh, the community that we live in. Are we in Weston? Are we in Lawrence? Are we in Springfield? Where do we live? The organizations that we belong to, um, how are those influencing us? Interpersonal, your friends, your peers, your family, um, and in the individual level, how much of the individual level things can we control to really moderate our relative amount of overweight and obesity? And really this falls into a much larger context of all of these levels of, of layers that can contribute to obesity. So the rise in obesity, really what is thought is that the, the inability of a single individual to control the environment that he or she lives in, and really all these factors come in combination to really not enhance their ability to fight sort of the negative, the negative causes of what could cause you to increase your body weight. And if you think about determinants of obesity, they are, there's, you can pull a million out of your hat, everything from educational priorities, the built environment that we live in, do we have sidewalks, can we walk to the park? Um, advertising and gaming, how much time do we spend um, looking at you know, advertisements for foods and do we see any for physical activity? Not really because no one's trying to sell physical activity. Um, food away from home, how many times a week do we eat in a restaurant? Um, sedentary attractions, even drive-throughs that have changed for, you know, you know, we had them in banks for a while but now it's Starbucks too. Um, family structure, you know, how does our family eat together or not? Cultural values, what foods are important and how important maybe is the family in terms of having a meal? Maternal environment, a lot of new science around which a mother eats while a child's in utero and how that affects what a child might eat in the future. It's quite fascinating. And then also breastfeeding and the relative amount of risk for becoming overweight as a, a child gets older. And biology, genes. You know, we used to talk about genes causing obesity. You really find it's a very small percentage of our genes that impact, you know, our risk of becoming overweight. However, if those genes are in different environments, let's say, you know, thinking about like the Pima Indians, they can play a huge factor. Psychology, how do we think about food and exercise? Purchasing power obviously makes a huge difference if we can't buy fruits and vegetables. Screen time, that's computer time and TV time. I know as a screen time person, it's mostly behind a computer for me, but I know it's not healthy even though I try to exercise almost as bad as the TV. Free play, something that's been lost in our society. Our kids, do we let them just go run around in the woods? Not as much as we used to. Are there increases in crimes against children? No. So definitely the, cult, the, the society has shifted in how we look at that. Social influences, food availability, and all of these things and more really go in combination in a lot of different ways to really contribute to whether or not we'll increase body weight. And this, if you just squint and look at this, this is how it's more complicated it gets. This was something we kind of had schemed out as a simple diagram on how many things come into play to cause obesity. And you can see up here, this is really overweight, a normal weight child and how you shift the energy balance between the caloric intake and the caloric expenditure. And this is simple, just simple things like knowledge and attitudes, how they can come into play with frequency of snacking, average calories of meals eaten away at home. They, all these things really are interrelated and are complicated. But I don't want people to get feel like we can't solve the problem. So what is the energy gap? What's gonna cause us to gain weight? In a child, it's really as little as 110 to 165 calories per day. So that's a little, don't eat that extra roll with your meal, but it also can be a lot if a child, you know, so it's really a can of soda for a child, a one ounce bag of chips, or one ice cream bar. And why am I using 
food as an example because it's probably the easiest way to get calories out of your diet without completely missing something. Because if you look at other things, physical activity wise, and I'm a huge proponent of physical activity, it takes a little more work to get rid of that 110 calories. That's a mile run for most of us. So um, if you think about a child, that actually might equate to TV viewing less than one, you know, 1.4 hours less a day. Probably really easy for a lot of kids because as you'll see later, a lot of kids watch more than three hours of TV a day. Walk for two hours, you're not gonna have a kid do that. Increase PE from one time to three times per week, Okay, that's a policy thing we might be able to change in some of our schools. Uh, for example, removing sodas just from the cafeterias in Boston high schools decreased caloric consumption by 35 calories a day. That's not even looking at how much they consume, per, you know, how many sodas they consume, but they just, that machine was not in their environment. So things can make a difference. Little things like that will add up. So poor nutrition. Adults. Um, Adults who have consumed five or more fruits and vegetables per day, for those of you who don't nutrition, that's how many you need to consume or you should consume for a healthful diet. And fruit and vegetable intake is a real marker that's used a lot in nutrition for general nutritional intake and health. And what you can see in terms of adults, only about 27% you know, consume five or more uh, fruits and vegetables per day in Massachusetts, and that's very similar to the rest of the US, so that's quite shocking. Um, kids, looking at the different food groups and what they actually should consume, and you can see here, dairy, this is the number that we actually consume, and the bar is actually the range that they should be consuming in. So fruit falls low, dairy falls low, vegetables fall low, whole grains is down here, definitely falls way off the charts there. And then grains themselves, because that could include white bread, we actually fall in the, the bar. So what our kids are taking in here in the state really don't um, fall into the guidelines. Um, looking at high school students, you know, different markers of nutritional intake, again, five or more fruits and vegetables per day, you know, staggeringly low, 15%. Uh, um, three or more glasses, three plus glasses of milk per day, I think really tough for um, as kids as they get older. Again, very low, about 15% of students do that. And ate breakfast every day. And I think a lot of us know how important breakfast is for academic performance. Um, again, it's one of those markers of overall health, typically those and also those who eat breakfast tend to be less, less likely to be overweight or obese. So only a third of the kids actually eat breakfast. Food consumption in middle schools, and this is talking about younger kids, the last slide was in high school students. Again, five or more fruits and vegetables per day. And at this point, you hope parents still have some influence. Um, only 12% um, in the eighth grade. One more glass is a soda per day, much higher, about 40%. So soda is, uh, you know, it gets, it's in the media now with the soda tax, and I won't get into it. But um, yeah, I won't go there, I don't think. It's, it's not worth the debate. We can talk about it later. But it is, it is a problem with soda consumption. So the other side of the equation. So we talked about calories in and nutrition in. What about physical activity? Um, did you participate in any physical activity last month? Adults, and this is by ethnic group, and you can see quite clearly um, any physical activity in the last month. So those of you that act, that's last month any. So in Massachusetts, you really see by race a, a huge um, disparity. And again, 80, you know, anywhere from 55% to 80% did. And then that extra, you know, 50 to 25% did not. 